Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today's episode, we welcome the CEO of a renewable energy company, Saluna. So I had to ask, what is renewable energy? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? The best definition I found in renewable energy, often referred to as clean energy, comes from natural sources or processes that are constantly replenished. Wind power and solar power are some of the most commonly known renewable energy sources, but so can water, like the ocean waves and hydroelectric energy created from dams. I have personally noticed solar panels being installed throughout Oregon much in the recent years, but why is any of this important to an entrepreneur? Almost two-thirds of wind and solar projects built globally last year will be able to generate cheaper electricity than even the world's cheapest new coal plants, according to a new report from ERNA, the lead intro-government agency supporting countries for their energy transformation. The transformation to renewable energy is already occurring, and the total expense may be going down, helping ease operational costs for some entrepreneurs and businesses. Renewable energy also helps conserve the Earth's natural resources. Fossil fuel accounts for over 80% of the carbon emission released in the air. Currently, most investments in renewable energy are used to build and maintain facilities creating jobs for our economy. In fact, renewable energy investments in the United States are frequently used in the same state, city, and sometimes town. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. Renewable energy will never be depleted while other sources of energy are finite and will be depleted over time. Renewable energy conserves the nation's natural resources and provides reliable power supplies and fuel diversification, which enhances energy security and lowers risk of fuel spills while reducing the need for imported fuels. Renewable energy is energy that comes from natural resources. However, those natural resources replenish themselves without depleting the planet's resources. Fossil fuels such as oil, coal, and natural gas do not replenish and do deplete. Once we are out, we are out. As an entrepreneur, we need to think of our globe first because we cannot be global entrepreneurs if we have no globe. Renewable energy emits no or low greenhouse gases. That is good for climate change. Fewer air pollution equals better health as well. But most importantly, an entrepreneur should care because renewable energy comes with low costs because it's produced locally, meaning it is less affected by geopolitical crises, price spikes, or the sudden disruption in supply chain. Moving reliability away from the corporate fossil fuel companies will provide affordable alternative while supporting local small businesses and not the price gouging record profit making corporations. It is time to put the power of energy back into the hands of the entrepreneur. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest is a serial entrepreneur who has successfully founded and scaled multi-industry leading technology startups that have achieved market leadership and double-digit growth. A former lead architect for the Intel Digital Enterprise Group, please welcome the CEO of Saluna Computing, John Belazare. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the CEO of Soluna. John, how are we doing? We're doing great. We're doing great, Gabriel. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, we're <laughs> and, and folks, folks listening, we're going to talk about something I'm, I'm very interested, like personally interested in, because it's something that I think we're all here about. And I think some of these questions are going to talk about that. We're going to talk today about renewable energy. So I'm really excited. But first, John... Let's introduce the world to you. Give them a little background, education, experience, and kind of just introduce them to you. Sure. Uh, although I'm, I run a computing business that helps the renewable energy industry with challenges that they have, I actually started my career as a software engineer. 
uh, I studied computer science in my uh, undergrad and, and grad. Uh, my alma mater is uh, Cornell, go big red. And uh, I was always fascinated by distributed computing. I did a internship uh, very early on in my college career uh, with Intel Corporation. Many people don't know this, but they did and still have a very large software function, you know, focused on helping to drive demand for their processors and so forth. So I would go out to, to the West Coast and, you know, uh, learn that. And uh, I've always had a drive to be an entrepreneur. So several little mini businesses in, in, in high school and I was always fascinated by how these very large um, companies like IBM where I interned and and I was just fascinated by what it means to be a, a, a corporate professional and how do you build a company from scratch. And in college, I had two grad school mates uh, that were also equally driven to become entrepreneurs. Uh, we wrote a business plan for fault tolerant distributed computing. And the whole idea was um, at the time, this was just when the internet was just taking off. And the whole idea was if you had web servers that were running your, your, your e-store, you never want that thing to go down. Very true. And so we yeah. would do these demonstrations or we would try to do these demonstrations where we would try to swing a baseball bat at one of the computers in the lab <laughs> <laughs> and show that it would still be running. And, you know, since we didn't own that equipment, we couldn't really do that, but we would shut one down and show how this, this, uh, this communication ring that we built could sort of keep them running. And uh, our, we were engineers and we took some business school and entrepreneur, entrepreneurship courses and they wouldn't let us into the courses because they're like, you know, you engineers, you can't take that. What do you guys know about business? They were right. We didn't know anything. <laughs> but, uh, but we went in there and we learned a lot and we set out to start the business. But I, we felt that we were all um, not ready for that. Uh, two out of the three of us uh, needed to get a visa to stay in the country and so they had to get a job. So we went off our separate ways. They went to the startup world. I went to the big company world. And then we came back two years later and started our first company. We built that from nothing in Boston uh, to about 50 people uh, doing 15 plus million in revenue. And then we eventually sold it for $150 million to a very large, uh, pub, fast growing public company that was building lots of systems for the new e-commerce re revolution, if you will. And uh, I went on to work for that company, was the on the management team of a new division that was formed. And we essentially um, 10X the size of our business wow. in a three, three year period. Wow. So we went from 15 to $150 million across the world. And I used to say, I, I live technically live in San Francisco, but um, in reality, I live on seat 3E on United Airlines <laughs> visiting the 50, 50 so. Uh, offices we had around the world, I really experienced what it, it means to scale a business. And uh, I just continued to do that. I went on to form um, a software inc incubation company and then eventually uh, an investment uh, group and uh, formed a new software company in the insurance space and always looking for really complex problems that have not yet been solved for industry. And um, in fact, my my insurance company experience, we spent 18 months just figuring out what the problem was the, the industry was having before we even wrote a single line of code. And uh, that has helped us to build very successful companies. And um, over the last 20 years, I've grown a lot as a person, a professional, an entrepreneur, and a, and a leader as a CEO. Um, I'm constantly trying to perfect the role, <laughs> if you will. And it's, it's, uh, you know, my strategy is get one, 1% 1 better every day. And, uh, uh, that's a little bit about me, uh, living here in New York, uh, married with kids and, you know, still very energetic about building companies and bringing in amazing people together to do exciting things together. Like it, you know, and, and so for the folks at home, there are going to be some times where I'm, I'm going to be unable or John might be unable to answer some questions because just, just so the folks at home at know, so Luna is actually a, a public trading company, correct? Yes, we are. Um, so Saluna Computing, the entity I run, is part of a, uh, a parent company called Saluna Holdings. 
So our ticker is SLNH. Sorry, Larry, Nancy, Harry. There you go. <laughs> oh, got that right. And uh, and so folks can learn about the the company. So yep. yes, there'll be some questions I'll I'll pass on. Perfect. No problem. We're, but we're but let's let's give them the the general synopsis first. What is Saluna? Yeah. How did the concept get created? What what does it do? So Saluna started about uh, back in 2018. It was uh, my one of my mentors, longtime investor in uh, a number of my companies, was having this challenge. He had a renewable energy development company in northern Africa, um, in Morocco. Oh, interesting. They were doing solar, hydro, um, uh, wind-type projects. They had one really big wind project in the southern part of the country. And they had this problem where the wind farm was actually stranded, so there was no grid infrastructure to speak of that the, they could connect up into to sell the energy. So the question was, how do you monetize stranded energy? And they got the idea of placing uh, Bitcoin uh, or integrated computing facilities at the location. And once they started thinking about that, in fact, they researched it for over a year, uh, it became clear that that project was no longer just a renewable energy project. It was a technology company. And I was asked to go run it. And we ran it for, we did the tr traditional things you do when you're building an energy company, right? You've got to prepare the land, you got to do some studies, you got to do some engineering designs and so forth. And we designed this uh, synchronized approach to connecting the energy production to the computing consumption uh, so that the computing can actually run off grid. And while we were doing that, the grid actually did make its way there, passes right over the site now. And, and we started conceptualizing a new architecture that integrated the power plant into the grid and um, uh, essentially makes the computing a battery almost oh, uh, where we can convert that excess energy because renewables are intermittent. And well, I'm sure we'll talk a lot about renewable energy uh, in the discussion here, but renewables are intermittent, meaning the grid can't really control when that power plant uh, produces energy. Sometimes it's going to produce more than the grid can handle. And so we had an embedded solution to that problem. And in 2020, the COVID happened and we couldn't get to the project. We started thinking about the long-term strategy of our business. And it became clear to us that if we took just the computing part and took it to other wind farms or other solar farms or other hydro plants, we can actually solve the same problem. The only question was, was that problem big enough to build a really large enterprise? And, uh, and so we spent you know, six to eight months, you know, on Zoom calls, talking to just about anybody we can get our hands on from equipment manufacturers to uh, grid scheduling entities, grid operators, power plant owners, and everybody told us the same thing. You guys got to work on this. <laughs> this is a big problem. Um, and this solution is very novel. You know, if you can scale it, make it work, it's going to be fascinating. So Saluna computing which is the company we sort of broke broke off into the energy from the energy development company and that we took that public uh, through a merger last year is focused on building data centers that help integrate more renewables on the grid and what we do is we go to uh, green energy power plants that are dealing with uh, basically wasted energy and most people don't know this but about a third of of the power that's produced by some of the best wind farms in the world, the best solar plants in the world, um, the best hydro plants, uh, never make it at, onto the grid, actually. It gets wasted because the grid is congested by the fact that it can't dispatch these power plants directly, right? It, it, it has to be planned ahead of time, and sometimes Mother Nature is interested in producing more or producing less than the grid needs. And so when it's producing a lot more, that creates this excess energy problem. So what we do is we bring the consumer of that power to the plant. And we've designed these specifically uh, purpose-built data centers that are highly flexible that absorb that energy and convert it to uh, computing, flexible computing, what we like to call batchable computing, any kind of computing that can be put to sleep. So um, cryptocurrency mining is one of them. Uh, AI is another, machine learning, scientific computing, graphics coding, uh, those types of applications are very uh, resilient to these types of environments. And they're 
some of the fastest growing forms of computing out there right now. So you put those two worlds together, it creates a very exciting confluence between the uh, computing world and renewable energy, which ultimately gets us to have renewable energy be the world's superpower. And yeah. that's the mission of our business is to make renewable energy the number one source of power in the world. Excellent. You know, I'm going to, um, I'm definitely going to talk about crypto shortly, yeah. but let's, let's do some definitions for the folks at home. What, sure. what, when you're talking about the grid, what, what do you mean? So when I talk about the grid, um, I'm talking about the entire grid system. So today we sort of take for granted, especially countries in, in the Western world, um, you wake up, you turn on the light switch, light comes on, <laughs> you don't, you don't think twice about it, right? Yeah. There's, there's never, I think when it goes off, I'm like, that, Hey, where the heck did my light go? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Actually you get upset. <laughs> uh, you turn on a toaster and it just works. Well, how does that work? And the way it works is you have all these different components uh, coming together in the current grid fabric. Um, you have power producers, so independent companies that build power plants that are designed to provide power into a grid system. You have the high voltage power lines that run, you've seen them on the road sometimes, oh, yeah. they're running you know, across state lines and sending power all across a, a particular state. Uh, that's part of the grid system. There are lower voltage distribution lines that kind of come down to your actual house or your business and so forth. That's part of the grid uh, fabric. And those distribution systems are managed by retail uh, electric service providers and so forth. And then there's the, uh, the sort of regulated uh, managed uh, grid operating company that's uh, uh, living at the state level, usually managed by the Department of Energy or some form like that. And they manage bringing all of those components together and making them work in a synchronous way to balance demand for energy with the production of energy. Gotcha. By design, and the whole model of the system is that there's a, there's a direct match between those two things for the most part. Sometimes you may have some peaking areas and so forth, really hot summers, <laughs> and yeah. you extra, extra power for those ACs. But generally speaking, you're trying to match that. And that has worked for a long time, that system that I've just described. You know, you've had, you have uh, coal power plants, gas-fired power plants on the system, providing the energy, and then you have these uh, distributed networks of power lines delivering electrons to people's homes and businesses and so forth. And, you know, the kids can see see the whiteboard because there's light <laughs> in the yeah. building. And um, the movement to renewable energy adding renewable energy to the grid and moving to more sustainable and climate friendly sources of power has created a major challenge for that model. And that is because in the system I just described, the grid can turn dials. Literally you have these giant rooms that no one, no one else gets to see, although apparently the Russians keep trying to hack them right now <laughs> and get inside there. Oh, sons um, of guns. <laughs> and there's, there's people managing that balance, right? They're yeah. firing up, you know, power plants or they're shutting them down and so forth. And uh, the goal is to keep that synchronization and keep the grid frink frequency, the rate with which the electrons are pumping through that perfect. Gotcha. But when you add renewable resources, what happens is the grid can't really fully dispatch those facilities. Technically they have control of them because they're connected to the grid system but how much energy is produced doesn't get set by them, right? Whereas a coal plant, you can dial it up or dial it down right. for the most part. And so the challenge that gets created is what I described uh, earlier, is you suddenly start to have lots and lots of these facilities that could be producing more energy than you need, and you have to dial that back, right? You, and that means calling the power plant and saying, dial yourself back, <laughs> right? And so imagine now you start adding more and more of these facilities on the grid, this problem gets worse. And uh, because power plant owners are independent companies, they're backed by big um, funds and so forth. You've, you've heard some of these names, BlackRock and, oh, yeah. <laughs> and whatnot, right? Giant companies. They invest 
in finding the best possible place to put a powerful facility, a wind facility. They, they go where the sun is really bright, right? Yeah. And then they all end up going the same place. I call it the McDonald's Burger King problem. <laughs> they all end up sort of right across each other because they're optimizing for where the best resource is. Yep. And so you suddenly have lots of power plants in a particular location of the grid also that's producing more energy than it can it gotcha. can it can yeah. it can consume and that puts a lot of congestion on the grid electrons can't get to the sources they have to dial back those power plants and so they start prices actually start to crash and go negative which then puts a lot of pressure on those power plants because they can't sell that power so they actually have to pay to send their energy uh, to the grid sometimes oh wow so when i say the grid system it's that fundamentally those pieces and the grid's challenges are fundamentally those pieces that's the grid perfect um in fact there's a there's a really good book um called the grid actually <laughs> that <laughs> Clever name. um if the listen, listeners are, are, are really interested in reading it um I'll, I'll send you the details you perfect. can put it in the show notes but that's a great history of the grid um the different components actually the grid used to be integrated in your home so if you had a if you had a house uh, uh, many moons ago, you would actually have everything there. The generator for your electricity would actually be in your basement and it would be provided by Thomas Edison's electric company. <laughs> so you'd buy a whole kit and put it together. And then over time, it moved to a decentralized approach where you have the, the capability not in your home, but provided as a public utility. And then that further decentralized where deregulation and focusing on you know separating the power plants from the the, the, the owner of the grid happened uh, that created the grid that we have today nice so now what would we define renewable energy what are what are some of the sources of renewable energy out there so the the biggest sources of, of renewable energy these days is uh, solar and wind uh, there are big hydro plants in parts of the world um, as well you have everything from you know, the big dams in this country, Hoover Dam, to the massive dams in Canada providing um, that electricity. And uh, the the other one is uh, geothermal uh, electricity as well. Um, there's also uh, hydro-based. Um, so, uh, you know, the change in a wave, for yep. example, oh, yeah. in the ocean can also create energy. There's lots of different things that are sustainable forms. But the... Um, you know, the big kahunas today are still are sort of solar and wind, and that seems to be in increasing at an accelerating rate, rate, actually almost exponentially because the doubling of effect or this concept called rights law. So as you build more of this stuff, um, it becomes easier to build because you've learned some things. And uh, as you learn those things, they, they help to uh, decrease the cost of that. And so you can build more of it and it just feeds on itself. Yeah. And that's happened to the renewable energy space. That's why it's become the cheapest form of power these days. So those are the, those are the dominant, those are the big boys. If you nice. Will. And shout out to my boy, Kurt, uh, Kurt, he's probably out there in Arizona. Kurt, he's, uh, doing a lot of solar, solar power, yeah. uh, solar, um, installations everywhere. So it's, it's crazy how many different, uh, renewable energy sources there are out there. Now, I want to talk about something that I'm sure is going to be interesting to a lot of the folks that are listening, because I think a lot of my listeners are into the investing world. So let's get into crypto. Okay. Cryptocurrency in particular, because I think I'm, I even have a misconception that, you know, cryptocurrency is actually really bad for our environment. And maybe, maybe it's true. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, but let's talk about cryptocurrency mining and blockchain and why they are important technologies that can fuel future energy. That's a great question. Um, I think the first question is what is what is cryptocurrency, and as you can you know you you start with sort of a high level question yeah. and you drill down and you yeah. start to you start to eventually see the relationship to energy. Uh, cryptocurrency, which Bitcoin really started, it's the biggest brand. Yep. Um, you know, it's it's the it's the godfather of the of the space, if you will. The basic concept is that. Um, Everything has been digitized. Think about it. Um, you no longer have to leave your home to order food. <laughs> you, um, you know, you can watch uh, movies uh, from your house. You know, um, education can be beamed to your home now. Or streamed. Built a global... Or streamed. <laughs> yeah, or streamed, right? <laughs> exactly. And 
just about everything has been digitized except for money. And we've seen the good and the bad that comes with that. Uh, money is a very powerful um, form of technology, if you will, to some extent, that powers uh, the global economy. It's uh, primarily sovereign based, so the concept of fiat. Uh, but there are challenges that have been seen, everything from inflationary uh, concerns, because one entity can decide to um, increase the output of that currency, uh, devaluating it. And some countries have had to do that for a number of reasons, not always good. <laughs> and so, um, and it's built around the concept of trust, uh, fungibility, uh, the ability for it to be transferred, etc. That's money. So the question that the creators of Bitcoin asked was, how would you create a form of money where you didn't need a central authority and trust was irrelevant? Right. How would you do that exactly? The first step is to uh, essentially create a series of different technologies that you're going to need to make that possible. And one of them is this concept of a, of a ledger where you keep track of who owns what and how much quote unquote money do they have. Right. And uh, that ledger today is very centralized. So you go to a bank, they keep track of how much money you have. And if they get it wrong, you get, you get into this big argument, et cetera, <laughs> but you trust that they're, they're documenting it correctly. Uh, but what if you didn't have that bank, there is no intermediary. How do you create a system to make that happen? Well, what uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the uh, pseudonym for the creators here basically came up with is an elegant system that essentially decentralizes the ledger. Well, everybody has a copy of the ledger. I have the ledger. I see what you own, what I own, what everybody owns. We share that and uh, we create a peer to peer system. And, uh, you know, when I was growing up during the e-commerce uh, world, I was there when Napster was sort of taken off and, oh, you yeah. know, creating a peer to peer network for digital, you know, content, content and so forth. Uh, not, not exactly totally kosher, <laughs> But the concept was there, right? Peer-to-peer -peer networks. So create a peer-to-peer -peer network that keeps track of all the transactions that are happening among all, all the participants. And since everybody has a copy, it's perfectly synchronized. And now you run into a new problem. Well, if, if everybody is trustworthy, then it should be synchronized and completely accurate. But if everybody isn't trustworthy, how do you protect that? And the trick is through something I like to call the magic machine. So imagine for a moment, listeners, that you're all keeping track of your ledger on a sheet of paper. I send a few Bitcoin uh, to Gabriel. Gabriel sends a few Bitcoin to his uh, pal in Texas, et cetera. And everybody is keeping track of that and everybody has a constant ledger of it. Now, imagine I told you there was this magic machine that took that sheet of paper, looked at everything on the paper, uh, and what could convert the entire content of that piece of paper to one fixed number. Or imagine I told you that the machine and the machine didn't care how big the content was. I can place the entire, you know, Bible, all of human <laughs> knowledge to the machine and it would create the same number of a fixed length. Now, by using that, we can make sure that if we, if we all push the piece of paper through the machine, uh, that number that it generates, okay, will be the same. And fundamentally speaking, if anybody changes that sheet of paper, we would know because if you push it through the machine, it would create a different number. So now what we do is we stamp those, that information on the page, and then we link that page to the previous page. So we start to not only uh, convert the page, but the actual, what I like to call folder. So imagine the page gets added to a folder as you link them over time, this form of, uh, of conversion, you know, uh, protects the folder and the pages. What I've just described to date is essentially the blockchain yep. and the magic machine is, uh, the concept of cryptography or hashing, if you will, turns it into a hash. Now, the only thing that's left is to encourage all the participants to protect and continue to perform that work 
by protecting those sheets and so forth and making sure that it's secure because now that the pages are linked through through hashing and, 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 and backward hashing, I have to create a reason for you to protect the network. So what I do is I say, everyone perform this exercise. And that exercise is, is to seal the page such that it the number that comes out of the machine looks a certain way. And usually it's a number of zeros in front of, in front of the, the number. And uh, the only way to get that is to put the sheets through the page, through the machine, one at a time to guess that number. There is no way, because that machine only works one in, in one direction. So if I give you the number, you can't get back to the transactions. And because everyone can do that, eventually someone will find that magic number, if you will, called the number that you use once or the nonce. And that number will stamp the blockchain and basically seal it forever. Really hard to to uh, to to break it down. But to perform that, I have to perform computing. To do computing, I need energy. And so the only way for you to have gotten that nonce is to have expended some energy. And so when you boil it down, that fundamental capability of the network to drive people to expend resources to protect the network makes a direct connection to something that's very clear energy consumption yeah. that's why bitcoin especially is a digital form of money that is backed by energy essentially or secured by energy is another way to think about it that's fundamentally crypto just about every other form that you've heard of eth uh, Solana, all these other, oh, all these yeah. other, yeah, they're everywhere. Dogecoin, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> they all fundamentally follow this concept of decentralized management of information that, that, uh, focuses on the protection of digital assets. They focus on this concept of, uh, of creation of assets based on certain activities on the network. Uh, and they focus on a host of technology to protect and secure that asset as it builds value. And that value comes from utility. So Bitcoin's primary utility right now, uh, although it started, it, it wanted to be sort of, you know, the, the digital cash, it's primarily a, a digital uh, s- store of value. So if, if you want to, you have a lot of money and you want to store value uh, for a long time that's independent of where you live, the sovereign, et cetera, you can convert that value into Bitcoin, store it in this secured network, and you know that there are actors and mining companies all over the world spending hundreds of billions of dollars building equipment to secure the network, <laughs> okay? No one can go in and increase the, the production of, of the asset, decrease it, change the, the, um, the, the ledger. You now have confidence that your assets will be protected and they are very easily transported. So if I'm in a country in Africa that where I don't trust the government, um, I can't just like take all my assets, run across the border <laughs> and, uh, you know, hide them in, in some, in, in, you know, dig a, dig a hole and hide them somewhere and hope they, they, they retain their value. You could actually convert your assets into this digital form, and suddenly they're 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 in they're in the network yep. and protected over time. Uh, that's cryptocurrency. That's the power of it. It has all sorts of implications for the financial services system now and 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 going forward. And we believe at Saluna that it also has because of the the feature that I just talked about, how energy is a feature in that system to provide yep. security is also a way to drive and ex- even accelerate the amount of renewable energy that we'll be able to build in the world. Nice. Now, one of the things we kind of talked about, you know, is the economy, right? And, and focusing on the economy, we talked about the grid as well. Now, let's talk mm-hmm. about the future of the grid. Like, what, what are we looking at forward? So how can it provide efficient energy that reduces energy poverty, but enhances the economy, equality growth, or equality globally? Very good question. Very good question. You know, when we were in Africa... Uh, I learned a lot about the energy space because what we were doing was very complex and I had to learn a lot about project finance and the energy industry and how capital comes in, etc. But I also got to travel the continent and learn about energy uh, in the, on the continent. And what I learned was that 
wow, I am very fortunate to live in the United States. <laughs> I'm very fortunate to have studied in Europe. The, you know, these infrastructures and economies are powered so much by the energy. Uh, you can see the effect that it has on it, right? The bi biggest countries in the world. In Africa, that's not true. There's an incredible amount of resources. There's wind, there's solar, there's hydro, all the things that, that, that we have over here, but they haven't been exploited to the, to the point where they can be developed and become part of the infrastructure to power the economy. You can't build or grow an economy without energy. Even in the southern part of Morocco, it was it was it was an economy that was growing. Um, it didn't have sufficient energy to reach the growth levels that it needed, so it needed those power plants down there. So, if we could find a way now, the the reason that is the case is because uh, while renewable energy was subsidized by some of the largest economies of the world to accelerate the industry over the last 20, 30 years, in Africa, it was few and far between the projects that were done and the original form of the industry relied on you selling the power to the government at a fixed price that's you know ironclad they're going to pay their bills and uh you know these countries can afford to do that so it's really hard to attract capital it's very challenging to build projects etc but if you could find a way to uh make it such that the economy let's say it's a small economy, can start building power infrastructure that's uh, essentially self-monetizing, mm -hmm. uh, where it's combined with this form of computing and a small power plant or big power plant, right? Initially, maybe even off-grid, it provides local microgrid energy to uh, an area that allows that area to, 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 to grow and expand. And as power infrastructure comes closer to that area, that power can then add, get added to the grid, which allows it to participate and grow the power infrastructure of that country. That country can then use that excess, that, that, that energy to drive uh, economic development. And it's never over, you know, uh, over tilted on power because yeah. the, you know, the computing has uh, is 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 monetizing it and also creating jobs locally. So you have this catalyzing effect on driving more more growth. I think personally, and we believe this very much at Saluna, that that represents some of the most exciting opportunities for renewable energy, bringing it to those markets in this unique way, and bringing more capital in to invest because you can make a good business case for that yeah and suddenly you you you're you're bringing more um technology to help all the grids of the world become modern grids and power their their economies yeah that's what i think is the future opportunity that's why i, I like getting out of bed it's it's, it's exciting because it's 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 something that could really help the world from a climate change perspective yeah. but also lift people out of darkness yeah literally literally it's dark yeah. Literally. When you fly over parts of our Africa, yeah, <laughs> uh, because they 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 haven't they, they don't have the ability to 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 grow. Yeah, you know, one of the things you mentioned at the beginning of our conversations is you kind of started out with this entrepreneurial kind of mindset, right? And, but you're a CEO now, yeah. so explain the evolving role of the CEO and entrepreneur. So um, there's something I've learned. Uh, several years ago, I want to say um, about a decade ago, and it was uh, in a CEO forum. So the, a CEO forum is where the simplest thing is like, the, the way to explain is like a bunch of CEOs uh, building startup companies get together and they literally, they just cry on each other's shoulders like, man, you had that problem too? I, I, didn't, I didn't know. Misery that. loves company, I'm telling you. My goodness. You know, it's like, wow. Uh, and then they, and then they, and then they shift to like, helping each other you know everybody has their strengths right and so you know they get up people get up and describe the challenges they're going through one of the, one of the exercises we do is we look at sort of where the company is in its stages of growth and what role the ceo has to play in that stage of growth and what most entrepreneurs and uh, ceos of smaller large companies don't realize sometimes is that the company is constantly changing 
it's growing up. It's like a child, you know, it starts out really young. It doesn't really know its way. It doesn't know its identity, what it's about, but it's, 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 it's lumbering along, you know, yeah. and then eventually it starts to grow, becomes an adolescent, has more awareness. It just continues to grow. And each phases of those, gro- of that growth. And by the way, it grows and it grows and shrinks too. Yes. So it's, yeah. so most people think, you know, entrepreneurial growth is just a straight line and up and to the right peaks and valleys. Baby. The reality is when you zoom in, <laughs> it's actually up and then it spirals down, then it goes up, then it spirals, you know, it, oh, yeah. it, it, there's, there's bad things that are happening along the way. And as the company breaks through those different stages of growth, the role of the CEO is constantly changing. You go from sort of being right there in the trenches with the team to moving up where you're helping to set direction and you're sort of managing. And then you move up to, being more of a facilitator for teams of very experienced people. And then you move up to where you're not focusing inside the company, you're focusing beyond the company and looking at the future where the company needs to go and what's happening outside of the company that could affect it. And you're ultimately becoming a coach. You're just the person who's making it possible for the team to be the best team that they can possibly be. Yeah. Not everybody knows how to make those transitions over time, but knowing that they exist, which is what I learned in the forum, helps you to understand the growth that you have to go through as an individual um, over time. So for me, uh, my journey has really been about that. It's about perfecting the CEO role. I like to call it the, the you know the one percent focus. Like every 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 day, I'm trying to how can I do this one percent better? What what can I do to be better? Um, how can I um, build the best possible team, make sure people are communicating? Wh- how can I uh, be a servant to them, remove uh, obstacles and make them successful? And one of the things that uh, I do that blocks the team, that slows us down, that, that, that prevents us from reaching our goals and being very uh, self-aware about it, humble about it, and, um, you know, talking to folks and, and, and listening and empathizing with the yeah. effects that I have uh, on it. And uh, I try to write down these learnings in an almost cathartic way. Um, I have a blog uh, uh, that I pen it on, <laughs> a personal nice. blog. And um, lots of people have found it very helpful because, yeah. uh, to be honest with you, um, making mistakes is actually okay as long as they're original. So I spend lots of time talking to people about what they've done that's similar to what I've done so that I can learn from it and try to avoid those mistakes and make real genuine uh, original ones that I can learn from. You know, that's what the CEO journey is really about. It's about, uh, it's about growth, self-reflection, firefighting, and ultimately uh, coaching. Yeah. You know, I was talking with uh, another guest uh, previously and, and one of the things you mentioned you learn more from failures than successes. You know, you, you learn so much more from a failure than you do from a success. And, and one quote I, I constantly say uh, on this podcast, I'm sure people are probably getting sick of me saying it, but I always <laughs> say I, I never fell a day in my life. I either learn or I succeed. And, and what I mean by that is if I fail, I'm learning something, right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mm-hmm. try it again and try it again until I succeed. Because yeah. uh, the way I look yeah, at yeah. failure is like, I just stopped trying. I'm not going to try anymore. Right. That's, that, that's right. You're done. Yeah. Failure yeah. is, is information. Yep. It's, uh, it, it's telling you, um, where your weaknesses are. It's telling you where your blind spots are. It's telling you what muscles are weak, you know, that you need to build. Yep. And, uh, it's, it's showing you the, you know, the red lights <laughs> so you can see the red light, the green yeah. lights, you know, yeah. that's what failure is. It's a very powerful asset actually. Yeah. Um, to your point. So, so going through it uh, as, as painful as it is, it, it changes your whole DNA. So you're, you're suddenly stronger the next time. Yeah. And once you realize that that's the role, you actually embrace it. You know, uh, we work in, in, in a very complex biz- business over here. We're constantly learning. And when something happens, I'm like, great. What, 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 what did we learn? <laughs> yeah. Bring me a you problem know? and I'll like, find hey, a solution. You know, but what yep. did we learn? What did we learn? You exactly. Know, how are we going to, use this to improve the process going forward. I like, so let's, let's switch gears a little bit. I kind of want to talk a little bit about that first business that you mentioned that you scaled and you brought up. How, how, how difficult was it to actually start your first business? 
Oh, the very first business uh, that that was hard. Uh, well, we it, it was our first one, so we you know we had kind of like the you know the energy that comes from oh, yeah. not knowing <laughs> how hard things are going to be. Just jump in feet first, not knowing what the heck. Yeah, going just on. go for it. You know, just go for it. We we had lots of excitement and you know uh, just passion to to to, to be successful. But literally, we knew nothing. And uh, uh, one thing I did, which I realized was was really helpful to me, is I said, I can't be the first person who's ever done this. And we built our company in Boston. And uh, Cornell used to do this great thing where they um, would publish this Cornell directory, like who all the alumni are, where what cities oh, they are, what their professions so are, smart. to help you to leverage that network. And so I looked at the Boston chapter and I said, you know, let me look at all the CEOs that are doing stuff that's similar to what we're doing. And I literally just cold called them. Hi, you don't know me. I'm John. I'm a Cornelian uh, and I'm, I'm running this company. And I just got so many questions as a new entrepreneur. You know, can you help me? Uh, look, 30 minutes is all I need. <laughs> 10 minutes. What do we got? Yeah, totally. <laughs> and folks started to call me back. You know, I went to their offices, um, asked them lots and lots and lots of questions. And then they would send me to other people to talk to and I brought back that information, shared it with my partners. And that just really helped us to start to build a framework around the things that we needed to do versus not do. As I said, we had mentors, you know, I, I work for one, one of those mentors now. And um, that was how we got through the really tough sleepless nights around how we're going to pay ourselves, how we're going to pay this employees. How do we, how do you raise money? Like, what does that, what does it mean to do that? You know? Yeah. Yeah, Who do you how, call how, first? What, you know? what did you do? How did you how did you fund it? Did you go grassroots? Yeah, so uh, we had this exercise where, where we um, we made a list. Uh, we had uh, the saying, uh, "Know who you know," because hey, you never know who you know. <laughs> so, Man, family and friends they they are really good. One hundred percent. Yeah, we made a list of family, <laughs> friends, acquaintances, professionals. You know, um, and uh, we just started dialing for dollars. We said, we need to raise $50,000. We need to raise $100,000. We need to raise $150,000. And I'll never forget this. Uh, we went to banks and got small business loans as well for our first company. And I'll never forget this. There was, uh, there was this one moment we were in our sort of shared space office here or there in Boston. And uh, we just spent our last dollar in the bank, literally. It was like buy a sandwich or something like that. <laughs> And we're like, what are we going to do? We're like, we're not going to be able to, you know, meet payroll tomorrow. And uh, after we finished lunch, they dropped off our mail and there was a $50,000 check, you know, uh, from one of our, wow. one of my closest friends to this day uh, to make an investment in the company. Wow. You know? And uh, that just kept us going. And, and from there, we, we, we eventually got uh, more professional capital into the business and, and, and grew it from there. But I got to tell you, the, those early periods, um, they were dark to some extent, right? Because you're, you're a little concerned you're not going to make it, but that's part of the journey. That's part you know, of it. Of yeah. Entrepreneurship, actually. It's really building a business is hard for a reason because not everybody can do it. And the companies that successfully do it and the teams that successfully do it build very big, successful businesses because they solve, consistently solve hard problems and make it look easy. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what has been the hardest part uh, starting a business? Um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, depending on the business, there are different hard parts. Um, building teams, for example, is hard. How do you attract really strong talent and uh, keep them motivated, growing? Uh, how do you build a culture? That's hard. Yeah. Uh, how do you uh, raise capital in a consistent way such that you're not, you know, giving away the company as you grow and, and how do you plan that, uh, out that that's hard. Uh, and, uh, as I said earlier, how do you transition from a founder culture, if you will, where you're sort of doing everything, you're making the coffee <laughs> to more of a professional management leadership and CEO driven culture. Uh, those things are, are, are very hard. And, and that's the, the, the stuff that I like to write about because they're the hardest part of the process. It's not, it's not usually the technology. So you, you, you know, you, you've got this great invention, you, you want to solve this problem. And some people think, oh man, we got all these hard technical problems to solve. 
that actually isn't as hard as building all the infrastructure and, and, and capabilities you need to be a company that delivers that amazing technology to the world. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the difference. What, what motivates you? Uh, I'm driven by building things. I, I like the experience of taking something from nothing to becoming a well-known uh, brand that solves real problems. I love building teams. That really motivates me. Um, I love finding all sorts of people from different walks of life, uh, diverse backgrounds, and bringing them together and forming quarter of a, kind of a, a new family, if you will. Uh, uh, I think companies are not families per se, but they're they're really sports teams to some extent, right? We're all working together to be successful as a, as an organization, and getting them to really act like a team. Right where you don't have many fight, fiefdoms and stuff like that, that motivates me creating that environment where people really enjoy coming to work. Like yeah. they're, they're just super jazzed about it, you know, and they, they're they doing what they're passionate about. That that does motivate me. I, I also am motivated by inspiring other young entrepreneurs from diverse backgrounds to try their hand at building a company yeah. and uh, and not being afraid of it. It's not, it's it's hard as I was saying, but it's not impossible. In fact, it will make you an amazing person, whether you succeed or fail, if you will, that, um, by going through it. And so being an inspiration to, to, to young uh, entrepreneurs uh, motivates me. Nice. I like it. You know, one of the things that's important for the listeners to know is no matter what you do in your career, the folks, the team, as you were mentioning, you know, John, the team that you mm-hmm. build, you're kind of probably spend more time with that team than your own family. So it's it's imperative yep. that the team you're working with, you really do enjoy working with it and you compliment each other, right? You, you compliment yeah, each other's services exactly. and things like that. Now, John, you're a CEO now. What, what are some yes. things that keep you up at night? Um, I'm always uh, worried about how uh, well we're executing against our goals. Um, I, 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 you build strong teams, but I'm always worried that I haven't communicated the commander's intent clearly enough such that when things, you know, go off kilter, the team knows that, you know, they can still push ahead and get to get to the end game. Commander's intent comes from, uh, it's a military term that describes sort of what to do in the field of battle. When you, you write the plan, you get out there and like all hell breaks, lo- breaks loose. <laughs> well, what you want to do is you're going to, you want to take the hill. That's yeah. the commander's intent. Like, you gotta do, Fight you or know, flight, take, I'm out. You know, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I, 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 you know, that keeps me uh, up at night, um, finding the, 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 the talent we need to grow the business. You know, it's a tough job market out there, yeah. you know, the other way around, Yeah. you know, getting, uh, getting the right folks together. And, um, and so recruiting, uh, really fantastic talent from all over the world, uh, and doing it, doing it well. And I think the other is just, um, the global economy and all the crazy stuff that's happening and how it could affect our business and the people in it. You know, um, I am uh, constantly praying for the people of Ukraine. I, I feel like what's happening is just terrible. And I think about all the companies that rely on the incredible talent over there that can't do that anymore and how it's, it's affecting them. I think about the uh, families of folks that are here that have families back there and um so those are kind of things that i I think about these days yeah yeah and that's that's a tough one you know i I constantly tell people we have to take a step back and kind of realize uh, this is this is my first pandemic is this your first pandemic right right yes yeah i miss all the (laughs) other ones right so so we we don't know like we're all going through a lot of a lot of stuff right and and so just take some time to be kind right a lot of people are going through a lot of things um the world the world's changing at a very rapid pace, right? Um, yeah. But take a moment to just, hey, are we doing okay, right? Because because burnout is also a big thing, and it's a it's a big concern. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah one I of the things about the the mental health of our teams. Yeah, because mental health people is are going to go. I think society, because of the pandemic, is going to go through a major health challenge over the next few years. And just make just checking in with people. Are you how are you doing? You know, yeah, is it's so important to do these days. Yeah. Now, how? Get, Give us some advice. What what advice would you have for the listeners, you know, listening right now? What what advice do you have for them? Uh, well, if you're listening to this podcast, it means you're uh, interested in entrepreneurship in in 
in the science of building companies and um, the experience of it, uh, I encourage everyone to read, read lots about um, companies and the history of building companies. Go way back though, go, go to, you know, the books that describe the founding of, of the early Silicon Valley uh, companies read about the failures, the companies that yes. actually didn't do well, you know, the, 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 the world wasn't built around the drop boxes and Facebooks and that's very true. <laughs> and Google's of the world. There's, there's actually few and far between of those. There's many, many companies that, um, become life, lifestyle businesses. Those are, those are completely legitimate companies. And, uh, people think that they've got to be building these big, large enterprises, small businesses that really provide a service at a local level or a niche business are still very real businesses. They have the same challenges I just talked about. They may or may not need an outside capital. So think through that. Um, keep a journal. If you're thinking about doing a business and you don't know an idea uh, that you want to do, uh, write a journal down yes, every day. I got my, like, got my journal you know, right here. Good ideas, notes. bad ideas. Uh, <laughs> there's no bad ideas actually. 10 ideas every day, sit down and write 10 ideas. If you can't think of 10, do 20 there and just go. write those down. There's always going to be one that sort of piques your interest. Like, huh, that's one I should pursue. Yeah. So do that. Uh, spend time collaborating with people. If you want to be an entrepreneur, spend time with other entrepreneurs or people who have entrepreneurial interests yep. that, uh, that, that, that common interest drives more energy into your goals yeah. um, than away from your goals. And I think the last thing is, um, you know, I've been going through sort of like this personal uh, transition, if you will, like what, you know, what, what's important uh, in life. And I would uh, say that it's really important for people to uh, not connect themselves to things. Yes. For me, uh, um, I guess the way to put it is don't fall in love with things. You know, things are transient. Um, you can use things, you know, take your, take your golf club and swing, you know, at the golf ball, but don't fall in love with the golf club. Cause it's not, it's, it's not a representation of what happiness is really about. Uh, but do, uh, connect with people, yeah. uh, fall in love with people, build relationships that are lasting. Uh, don't forget to call your, your, your mom or your brother or sister, uh, because those are the things that ultimately, you know, drew, uh, truly drive happiness, build long-term relationships with your peers and professional um, colleagues, et cetera, really lean into that yeah. um, yep. and stay away from relationships that are, uh, you know, uh, transient, if you will, or, or, or not very deep. And then I think the last thing is just try to do things that ultimately are important beyond yourself. So when you think about the business that you're building, what's its purpose and is its purpose beyond just putting money in your pocket or, you know, solving a problem for one business? What, what's the, the, the higher purpose of the, of the enterprise and try to zoom in on that and always make sure that that's clear and make sure you're, it's clear to your organization. And the more that purpose can be beyond the product or service that you're providing, the more successful you will be. I like it. You know, one of what a former guest said, if, if our communities aren't doing well, our businesses never will. And that's so true. That's you right. Know, we yes, got we to yes. focus on we, we spend a lot of time on that at Saluna, you know, thinking about how is this going to affect the community we're going to be in? How can we grow the community that way? Um, I 100% agree with you on that. Yeah. Now, now, speaking of Saluna, before we leave, how can they contact you, John? Or how can they follow the company, social media sites? How, how can they learn oh. more about it? Absolutely. Um, so on Twitter, uh, you can follow me. I'm Jay Belazare, CEO at, or at Jay Belazare, CEO rather. Uh, our company is at Saluna Holdings on Twitter. Uh, we're also on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find Saluna on LinkedIn and myself on LinkedIn. Uh, we're on Medium if you uh, are, are there. We actually have our own podcast called Clean Integration. Um, every all of these things places you can get by going to our website salunacomputing.com and you can learn more about uh, everything we're doing um, some of the projects that we're working on and uh, we have lots of content around cryptocurrency and renewable Excellent. energy that, that that's very educational yeah 
encourage you guys to, to check it out. And we have a great channel on YouTube as well, where we give cool insights on what's, you know, some of our projects, uh, our people, myself and our parent company CEO, um, Saloon Holdings, we do um, uh, AMAs. So folks send questions and we answer them. Nice. Uh, because we really want to connect to our community, people supporting the company. Um, so check us out in those locations and uh, 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 we look forward to hearing from you. Excellent. John Belazare, the CEO of Saluna, corporate entrepreneur, energy expertise. Oh man, this was a great, great conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time. For those folks at home, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or you can subscribe to the Shades of Entrepreneurship podcast, as well as the newsletter. In fact, John, you were mentioning, um, you know, writing at least 10 ideas a day. For those listeners at home, if you are struggling trying to find an idea, sign up for the Shades of E newsletter. I wrote a book, The Starting Line, which actually goes through the mind maps that is actually famous by the IDEO school, um, the, the Stanford school, uh, D school down there in California. And it really takes mm. you through the process of how to, how to start thinking of different ideas. And it really helps you spark some creativity. So please do sign up for the newsletter. John, thank you so much again for this time. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.